Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. We have had a couple of near misses when it comes to rain lately, but this evening is shaping up to be more like what we've been needing and wanting. Storms starting in the hill country now pushing into San Antonio. Here's Adam Kasky, who was tracking it all for us, Adam. Yeah, and in that a beautiful live picture there from our live cam overlooking 410. I know the timing is not ideal here, being the evening rush hour and all people hitting the roadways, trying to get home, pick up their kids, run some errands. You know, hitting the roadways. Not the best timing, but this is exactly what we needed. And you take a look at the big picture, widespread activity from the Rio Grande all the way up through I-35 from San Antonio into Austin. It is scattered in nature, so there are some holes in the rain. Uh, for example, far west side of San Antonio now along 1604, seen a break in the activity and I do anticipate it to come and go as we go through the rest of this evening and I want to start a little bit farther to the north right now. That's where we've had most of the activity so far today. That's uh, really just developed over the past several hours and you get into Comal County. Canyon Lake, Smithson Valley, even 281 from Spring Branch southward till Bul Bulverde, up to about a half an inch estimated by the Doppler radar. These darker greens indicate closer to an inch of rain. So for example, let's get into the western part of Timberwood Park here, right off Blanco Road. And this is just one of those spots near Camp Bullis, point nine inches estimated by the Doppler radar. So some very healthy rainfall accumulations and the placement of these is critical because that's the aquifer recharge zone. That's the sweet spot for boosting the aquifer and it should really respond nicely to this. Uh, you look elsewhere and these other greens half an inch to an inch Windcrest, Wetmore, Northeast Madison High School area uh, back to the actual radar and you see this heavy activity gradually drifting eastward. It's really just developing as we speak drifts eastward slowly and then kind of rains itself out and then a new one develops elsewhere. And this is all part of a frontal boundary that's been pushing our way. Now, I mean, this is a one hour lapse and you see how most of it just filled in over the past 30, 20 to 30 minutes on the south side of San Antonio. That's where some of the heaviest activity is right now. There is the potential for some flash flooding, and I do want to stress to exercise caution on the roadways because we haven't had this situation in a while, and it's easy to forget. You know, turn around, don't drown, and uh, just turn around and stay away from the high water on some of the roadways. Now, there's going to be ponding of water, but right now we don't have any flash flood warnings locally. Just one out west near Del Rio, including the city of Del Rio, and that's until 8:30 p.m. More activity westward. There's that warning shown in green. We're going to share some photos with you. Uh, take another look at these showers because they just keep developing coming up in a little bit. And this isn't it for the week. We have more to talk about. All right. Thank you, Adam. She faces a wide range of criminal accusations covering her 33 months in office. And today was step one in the trial of indicted ex-constable Michelle Buddy in this Vela jury selection. Dylan Collier on how that process is playing out and what we've learned on the eve of this criminal case. <laughs> Nearly three years after leaving office tainted by possible criminal wrongdoing, Michelle Barrientes Vela walked into the Justice Center to face close to 100 of her peers, now being whittled down to 12 plus several alternates. The ex-constable was indicted in early 2020 on a list of public corruption charges, but will first go to trial on two counts of felony tampering with evidence. Prosecutors say Barrientes Vela concealed security payment logs for the county's Rodriguez Park and knowingly made her own record of them while her actions at the Westside Park were being investigated. The witness list for trial is long, nearly 60 people, and includes her former captain, Mark Garcia, who also faces criminal charges for his tenure with Precinct 2, along with Leonicio Moreno, a member of her initial county administration. He was arrested in 2019, months after filing to run against Barrientes Vela in the 2020 election. I believe Michelle Barrientes believes that she's, she's above the law. Her attorney, Nico LaHood, said he's ready to begin opening arguments. And how confident are you going into what's going to be a very big couple weeks? We're, we're ready to try this case. And Judge Mesa, Velia Mesa, the, uh, the judge in this case, wants the 
guilt and innocence phase to be completed by September 1st, which is just over a week from now. Barrientes Vela, if convicted, has asked for the punishment phase to happen in front of Judge Mesa instead of in front of a jury. Reporting live downtown, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. All right, thank you, Dylan. And the opening arguments are slated to begin at 1030 tomorrow morning. You can watch the entire proceedings on KSAT.com, KSAT Plus, or on the KSAT YouTube channel. Happening right now, Uvalde CISD School Board is set to hear grievances filed against Superintendent Dr. Hall, Hal Harrell. It's happening in a school board meeting, a special one that's being held behind closed doors tonight. We know several grievances have been filed when it comes to safety and security protocols not followed on May 24th. Lee Waldman is at that school board meeting. She was sent a copy of at least one grievance that's been filed. A father of two children, one who is at Robb Elementary the day of the shooting, sent me a copy of one of the grievances he filed. He tells me there's five more just from him, all demanding accountability from Superintendent Dr. Hal Harrell. The grievances state there were many systemic failures on May 24th that made the massacre, quote, more convenient for the killer. It goes on to say his son and daughter are scared to go back to school because they don't feel safe. This father is asking for Dr. Hal Harold to be removed from his position. This complaint is just one of several the board members will hear about behind closed doors. When they come out, they'll have the opportunity to consider and take possible action on those grievances about the superintendent. No decision is required tonight. Board members have until the next scheduled board meeting to make that decision. That's scheduled for the third Monday of the month. Tonight on the Night Beat, we'll bring you the full wrap of what happens tonight at Uvalde CISD's special board meeting. In Uvalde, Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. Two men are recovering after an overnight shooting on the city's east side. Officers responded a little after 1230 to the 4600 block of Belinda Lee. That's near East Houston Street in South W.W. White. The victims told police they were walking when another man approached them and then started shooting. One man was grazed in the head, the other shot in the leg. That shooter took off. Both victims were taken to a hospital and they are expected to be okay. Six years after the crime occurred, investigators hoping a new call for help will lead them to whoever is responsible for the deadly shooting of Jacob Perales. The 19-year-old was found with a gunshot wound to the head on August 31st, 2016. It was his birthday. Investigators say they believe the shooting may have been drug-related after finding a small amount of suspected marijuana. Several people have been interviewed in this case, but no viable leads or suspects have emerged. Information that leads to an arrest in this case could be worth a cash reward from Crime Stoppers. Just call those tips into 210-224-STOP. Patients and politicians seem to agree there is an insulin price crisis in our country. That's why families were upset to see GOP leaders drop a pricing provision from the Inflation Reduction Act that was just signed into law. A Bernie 10-year-old and his mother sat down with Courtney Friedman to explain why that price cap is so necessary. 10-year-old <laughs> Jameson Wardle from Bernie wakes up each morning and eats his cereal, a simple thing that's become complicated since his type 1 diabetes diagnosis five years ago. Since I don't have insulin, I don't have much energy, and if I don't have enough carbs to sustain that 180 to 280, range, I'm either going to go woo or very tired and dizzy. It's life sustaining, but expensive. One insulin vial can cost $300 or more. He only goes through about a vial and a half a month. Um, I was talking with somebody in the chapter this week and sh her daughter goes through two to three vials a week. That's why Jameson's mom, Jennifer, was ecstatic to see a $35 per month cap on insulin added to the Inflation Reduction Act. She was also devastated when part of that was pulled, leaving the cap only for diabetes patients on Medicare. There are approximately 8 million people in the United States who use insulin. Of those 8 million people, approximately 3 million of them are covered by Medicare. That means 5 million people with commercial or no insurance will still pay steep prices, something Campbell Hutton is fighting to change. She's the VP of Regulatory and Health Policy for JDRF, an organization that supports and lobbies for type 1 diabetes patients. She says bipartisan legislation called the Insulin Act would apply that price cap to the rest of diabetes patients. JDRF is urging Congress to, to take that act up as soon as possible. 
for people across the nation just like Jameson. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. At last count, Governor Greg Abbott says nearly 8,000 migrants have been bused to New York City and Washington, D.C. Thousands more have been turned back at the border, even as hundreds continue to arrive. For small border communities like Eagle Pass, Jesse Degollado tells us the free bus rides are a relief valve of sorts and an opportunity few are willing to pass up. A boatload of immigrants, an ocean away from their homelands, within a welcoming sight, America's Statue of Liberty. Over a century later on a bus pulling up on the streets of New York, greeted by handmade signs and handshakes, are asylum seekers, many having crossed the jungles, mountains, and rivers of South America, then Central America, then Mexico. They'd started the last leg of their journey into the U.S. in Eagle Pass, thanks to a free bus ride courtesy of Texas Governor Greg Abbott in response to a record influx at the border. Now the rest of America is understanding exactly what is going on. Judging by the looks on their faces, the governor's point is lost on the asylum seekers, leaving the shelter at Mission Border Hope. It's a better option for them to go. They, they think that. Its director, Valeria Wheeler, says those legally allowed to apply for asylum are dropped off by the hundreds daily by the U.S. Border Patrol. But before they decide whether to catch the next bus to the East Coast... We tell them the truth, what is happening. New York City and Washington, D.C. are struggling to keep up with the new arrivals. If they don't have family, she tells them, overcrowded shelters or worse await them. If they leave and they don't have a place to go, they might have to sleep on the streets. We really tell them that if they need to wait or something, wait with us. Or Mission Border Hope buses them here to San Antonio's Migrant Resource Center if they have bus tickets or flights to catch. Having come this far, Wheeler says, they're not about to give up, even if nearly two days on a bus is a long time. Ay, si, es mucho tiempo. They're travelers, okay? Jesse de Goyado, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look outside of traffic right now. This is the TransGuide camera I-10 in Ackerman. Adam Kasky was talking about how this rain, of course, hitting right during the 6 o'clock commute home. Certainly wet roads out there are causing a bit of a slowdown as folks get off the highway here. But something uh, slowing people down, but worth taking note of because we've been waiting on this rain for quite some time. Let's take another live look outside with live cam. This one over on the south side of San Antonio. You can see the uh, raindrops there on the camera. A beautiful site. That's I-10, actually. We were told it was going to be somewhere else, but that's where that one is. It's <laughs> nice to see the rain wherever it is, and hopefully you're getting some in your yard. See something, say something, but to who? When something needs to be reported, but it's not a crime, it can be tough to know how to report that information. We're all more vigilant these days because of potential threats. Well, today in a new case that explains, we're introducing you to the team responsible for assessing threats in San Antonio. They work in the Southwest Texas Fusion Center. Some of the troubling details discovered about a suspect after a mass shooting, that's the kinds of reports that they often work with. And those behavioral indicators could potentially be tips that we would process, look at, and try to say that maybe we should do something more with it. But it is not just SAPD or even officers who work there. Check out this case that explains coming up at 630. Welcome back. I'm Stephanie Jimenez and here's what we're working on for you tonight on the Night Beat. Another first day of school for more than 100,000 students in San Antonio. But now let's talk about your kid. If their jitters continue beyond the first day, it could be anxiety. What a local pediatric psychologist says that parents need to look out for. Also, new changes coming to the historic Alazan uh, Apache courts. How, uh, how it's being reimagined to help families in the affordable housing complex. We're going to show you the design options and also how you can make your voice heard on that project. We'll see you for those stories and a lot more tonight on The Night Beat. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, all right, we've been taking a look at the roads around town. We found a trouble spot here, I-37 at Fair Avenue. You can see there's a big backup here. Fire trucks on the scene, roads very wet. We haven't seen this for quite some time, so it's 
certainly going to cause problems, especially during this time of day, but something to uh, watch out for in this area. Also hearing from CPS, 16 outages right now affecting 850 people, so not a whole lot of uh, trouble as far as the electricity at this point. Yeah, and this is something that Adam Kasky, we have been wanting, we have been waiting on, and this is not our only chance for it. No, I think we're going to see more of this off and on the next several days this week. And here's the view in Del Rio from Cindy. This is on our KSAT Weather Authority app through KSAT Connect. Nice ponding of water in the lawn area. She says almost covering the sidewalk. We have some other photos too. This is Uvalde. It was coming down hard in Uvalde. And you can just see this here from this stab static image, the heavy rain. And I know for some folks, this is all you're seeing. You're not getting much, if any, rain, but off in the distance, you see those downpours off in the distance that kind of tease you, but you will have more opportunities for some soaking rain in the days ahead. Heavy activity scattered about San Antonio now, especially along and east of Highway 281 and even I-10. You go farther to the west, and one thing I like to see here is this lighter, just soaking rain in parts of the hill country, Edwards County, Real County, moving into Bandera County, this stratiform precipitation that's slowly drifting its way eastward, and that's some good soaking rain. Heavy activity west of I-35 south of town, and locally, we still have some heavy rain, but it's starting to let up on the west side of San Antonio. Not seeing as much activity around 1604 and 410, but now the action is basically right along I-10 east of downtown and Elmendorf, Calaveras Lake, you get on the far south side. This is where the action is and the heaviest rain is located at the moment. Also a little bit of lightning and thunder with this. You see these white lines here. I usually call them the whiskers on the radar screen. Those are the actual cloud to ground a lightning strike. So there is a little bit of lightning with this. And, you know, Tim mentioned the few power outages, most likely a result of lightning strikes. Whenever we have lightning strikes, we get some power outages. But now this is starting to push eastward and really develop eastward. It's not even moving a whole lot. There isn't a big push in the atmosphere. We're more or less just seeing development as the cold front drops in and even as that outflow boundary moves through. So Lavernia, you're about to get a good soaking. It's headed in as we speak and about to cross over 87 in Lavernia where 87 makes that little dog leg right there. So this is good to see. And we talked about rainfall accumulations. I wanna show you how heavy the rain is falling and actual rainfall rates because this is a combination of some instability in our atmosphere and a ton of moisture. And I'm not just saying how humid it was today and humid it is, but we're talking a saturated atmosphere from the ground all the way up. So when you look at the uh, rainfall, we've had the greens indicating a half inch to an inch of rain, but the rainfall rates have been very high, especially within the heaviest rain here. And the purple on the city's south and southeast side of town right along I-37, we're talking six inches an hour. So if it rained at this rate for an hour, those areas would get around six inches of rain. So that doesn't help out when traveling on the roadways in this kind of a situation. It of course can cause the ponding of water and flash flooding is a concern. For the rest of the evening, I do anticipate these scattered showers to be coming and going. Scattered downpours is probably the best way to, <laughs> to describe them through the evening hours and even overnight tonight some. Flood watch in effect through 1 p.m. tomorrow, so keep that in the back of your mind for the morning commute. And this isn't it. Look at Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we have those elevated rain chances. I know it says 50%. That doesn't mean a 50 50 chance. It means good coverage. About 50 to 60% of our viewing area should get hit by it across South and Central Texas. Temperatures, these are interesting. A lot of rain cooled air, but also that weak cold front. So some 70s behind it. 75 officially at the airport right now. 100 in Catula. There's the difference. Huge difference across our area. That boundary. That's going to stall and sit overhead for uh, basically the rest of the week through Thursday and act as that triggering mechanism to help kickstart more of these downpours. So tomorrow that 40 to 50% throughout the day coming and going a little bit of sunshine in between 75 in the morning, 89 the high temperature. I do think there will be some uh, wet roadways and ponding of the water for parts of the morning commute. And then we get into the weekend, rain chances fall off a bit. Still some isolated activity, but that's when we get back into the 90s. Notice no triple digits still. Mm-hmm. And more opportunities for rain. Thank you, Adam.
All right, Craig, if the UTSA Roadrunners want to repeat their success from last year, they've got to get past three tough opponents right out of the yeah, game. Yeah, they open their season with one of the toughest schedules I've ever seen for UTSA. When we come back, what do the players have to say about that schedule looking forward? You know, they never want to look past one game at a time, but this one you can't help but look at. Also, we come back, the Alamo Heights Mules are moving to a new district. Coming up. It's hard to believe that the UTSA Roadrunner season opener is now less than two weeks away when they host number 24 Houston in the Alamo Dome. Houston is just one of three tough first games for the defending Conference USA champions. They're coming out their best finish in school history for winning 12 games this past season. But following Houston, the Roadrunners have road trips to Army and UT right up the road in Austin. So what does one of the leaders on the team say when people ask him about going up against three very good teams to start this season? I let them know I'm excited for them, but I try to not get too in depth with it just because, uh, you know, just like the U of H game, that's that's the one that we're thinking about right now. And uh, we got another opponent before UT and Army, so don't try to look too far ahead into it. But I'm definitely excited for, you know, all the games this season. And the Roadrunners' first game of the season kicks off 2.30 p.m. in the Dome one week from this Saturday. You'll make me tear up. I'm, I'm, I'm the soft the other two, right? Now, I hope you didn't miss part two of Larry Ramirez's interview with Roadrunners head football coach Jeff Trailer on instant replay last night and his wife, Carrie, where Trailer got pretty emotional over the sacrifices she has made to be a coach's wife and the strain it can put on a family. Part three will be this coming Sunday that includes one place she wants him to run. For the first time since Quinn Cures is named the starting quarterback for the Texas Longhorns, we're getting reaction today. Head coach Steve Sarkeesian felt the Ohio State transfer and former South Lake Carroll star beat out the more experienced Hudson Card. Now that's after Casey Thompson transfers, now the new starting quarterback for Nebraska. I think Quinn provides um, the ability to make all the throws in our system. I think he's got playmaking ability. He's got natural passing ability. Um, I will say it was a tough decision. Um, Hudson is a very good player. He's got great leadership skills. Uh, he's got the utmost respect of our coaching staff and, and of his teammates. Uh, there's a reason he's on our leadership committee because of all those things. And I've said all along, there's probably going to come a point in this season, and uh, whether it's one play, one drive, one game, two games, I don't know, we're going to need Hudson Card to win a championship. The Longhorns will host Louisiana Monroe on Saturday, September the 3rd at 7 p.m. before hosting number one ranked Alabama the following week. The 2022 high school football season kicks off this week, starting on Thursday night with three big games, followed by a first full Friday. And then the KSAP Pigskin Classic 2022, presented by your San Antonio area Chevy dealers on Saturday in the Dome. Now, one of the teams will be competing on Friday night will be the Alamo Heights Mules, who are ranked number three in the first edition of 12's Top 12, and will face the Sakeem Matadors in their season opener. It's after the Mules were moved to District 14-5A Division 2, where they'll compete with the San Antonio School District teams, along with Harlan Dillon McCollum. Head coach Ron Riddleman welcomes is back nine starters after going undefeated in the regular season last year to finish at 13 and one six on offense three on defense including linebacker tommy colligan who had 19 sacks to his credit also back wide receiver red anderson at 21 receiving touchdowns we feel like we have some veterans guys that played a lot of football along with the jv group that won a lot of games last year, but they also got to stay in practice for those next four weeks. And so that's really another half season for those guys. We got really comfortable in the playoffs and we had a tough loss, but we're ready to come back this year and hopefully make it further. We look at it all the same. We're going to put our best foot forward every game and give it our best, prepare for a playoff, deep, deep playoff run. All right, the Mules will be on the road to Seguin for their opener at 7 p.m. in Matador Stadium. That's on Friday night. We'll have a very busy weekend coming a up. A lot of high school football coming our way. Yeah, yeah, we're looking forward to it. Thanks, Greg. Straight ahead, see something, say something, but to who? We take you to the Fusion Center and a new case that explains next. the era of see something say something it was a campaign started by homeland security more than a decade ago now to combat terrorism and it is even more true today when it comes to preventing mass shootings but who handles reports of threats or red flags especially if what's being reported is not a crime at least not yet in this case that explains we're taking you to the fusion center it's really hard to understand from the inside looking out it's kind of hard to explain 
Tina Barron. I'm a sergeant with the Fusion Center and on SAPD 23 years. When you tell somebody what you do, how would you describe the Fusion Center? The Fusion Center is a hub for information sharing. It's a multi-agency, multidisciplinary uh, environment. That means a lot of people from a lot of different agencies in one room with one goal, keeping a giant eye out so they're ready to respond. So if you look at a lot of after action for large scale events or mass casualties and where the biggest gaps are, it's always communication. So having those relationships built into our day-to-day -day communication allows us when something does happen to already have those relationships built in. SAPD, the San Antonio Fire Department, Bear County Sheriff's Office, Joint Base San Antonio. As things are happening outside or around the base, he's engaged because he can hear it and see it right next to us. All those agencies are working together to monitor surveillance views in real time across the city and radio traffic as crews are out responding to calls. They're going to start monitoring right away. As soon as they hear it, they get on that call and they start looking and to see if there's anything that they can provide as the officers are on the way or arriving on that scene as it's happening. This team is also responsible for combing through tips, information that's sent in through Crime Stoppers, SAPD's non-emergency line, and the TIP 411 platform. It's a text or online tool where anonymous tips can be sent in. You text the information to TIP411 or go to sanantonio.gov slash SAPD to make the report online. After a mass shooting, we so often hear about the troubling behavior in the shooter's past, things they said or did that were disturbing. But if it's not a clear cut crime, should that be reported to law enforcement? Is it enough? The team at the Fusion Center says absolutely. There are often behavioral indicators with those individuals leading up to those events. Uh, that's been shown by research done by the FBI and the Secret Service and other entities. And those behavioral indicators could potentially be tips that we would process, look at, and try to say that maybe we should do something more with it. A big part of responding to tips like that means working alongside clinicians with the Center for Healthcare Services. So the Center for Healthcare Services is the local mental health authority. Three mental health clinicians work inside the Fusion Center every day. If they deem that it's appropriate for the clinicians to go out, the clinicians will actually go out into the field with an officer attached to them and basically do kind of a risk assessment, kind of figure out what's going on. How can we help you? Is this individual um, you know, untreated? Are they not actively on medications? Had they have been on medications, would they have, you know, made the threats that they made? Sometimes the person refuses help or no action can be taken by law enforcement. But that initial tip could be one piece of a larger puzzle. The individuals who are on that pathway to violence, it's, it's not something that they snap and do something right at that time, right? That person that we're kind of looking for in that context has some planning involved. That leakage may be a piece of it. And that leakage being they're saying that they're upset or have a grievance or want to hurt somebody, that alone may not be something that we go out and engage with, but that's a piece of what we may need to know more about. It's always best to err on the side of caution. If something makes you uncomfortable, you have a gut feeling, it's always the best thing to step up and say something, whether that's to a teacher, a family member, a colleague. See something, say something to someone. The Fusion Center also does threat assessments ahead of big events in San Antonio, things like Fiesta or the Holiday River Parade. You can find the information on how to submit a tip by scanning this QR code you see here. That will take you to the Case That Explains webpage, where you can also find all of the explained stories that we have done so far. San Antonio fire investigators say they have a question they may not be able to answer. They say they may never know who or what started a fire that caused damage to one building of a Southside motel. It broke out about 630 this morning at the Rainbow Motel on South Presa, not far from South Cross. As Katrina Weber reports, guests got an early morning wake up call in the form of smoke and flames. Before the sun had come up completely, flames were casting an orange glow mixed with thick black smoke over the Rainbow Motel. Guests also were up and out, ready to run if needed. 
We did not have to actually evacuate anyone. Uh, I was told that the small number of uh, residents that were at this ho uh, motel were already out in the parking lot. San Antonio fire crews had scrambled to the 4700 block of South Presa after 6.30 this morning, then got right to work. They found flames already through the roof and hiding deep inside its layers. They had to break their way through shingles to make sure it was out. Also, we did have some trees and power lines nearby. Um, so, you know, at this point, the good news is it did not spread. Firefighters searched that building but didn't find anyone inside the rooms. From what other guests tell me, there wasn't anyone staying in that part of the motel. Fire crews say there also wasn't anyone hurt. Investigators believe the fire started outside the building on the back side. But due to the damage it caused, they say they can't tell exactly how it started. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Take a live look outside with live cam, a beautiful sight around San Antonio, rain, lots of it. Oh, finally, finally some good soaking rain and we are not done yet, Adam. No, we have more opportunities, but this is going to be the general trend and pattern where, you know, a downpour here, nothing there, just gray, kind of ominous looking clouds. And then a downpour may just pass over your neighborhood. Then you get a little bit of sunshine behind it. That's the nature of this kind of pattern that we're in. And you can see the far west side of San Antonio, Getting a break from the activity right now. I and mean, we're talking Alamo Ranch, SeaWorld, even up to Leon Valley and Holotus. But the heavy rain now on the east side. So the west side's getting the uh, getting the break. The east side, this is where the heavy rain is at the moment, especially along I-10, 1604, and even Highway 87 here. We'll take another look at radar, how much rain has fallen and where, and those rain chances for the rest of the week coming up. In a rapidly changing industry, local high school students are learning the basics of automotive service and more. The goal here is to get them college and career ready once they graduate high school. Tiffany Huertas takes us inside Northeast ISD's Transportation Technology Academy, where there is currently a wait list of students just to get into that program. Today we've got, um, we've got our second year students doing um, inspections on vehicles. Roosevelt High School junior Gabriela Cortez Guerrero is excited to return to the Automotive Service Center and Northeast ISD's Transportation Technology Academy. Well, last year I learned how to change oil, like the oil filters. I uh, learned how to jack cars on the electric and then the hand jack. Um, Learned how to rotate tires, check tire pressure. Gabriela is part of the automotive program at the Career and Technical Education Center, where students are getting industry exposure. So they'll get an opportunity to do brakes, steering, suspension, engine performance, um, electric electronics, and then they'll take that into their fourth year where they have an opportunity to do a practicum where they're actually working out in industry. Technology is changing the auto service industry and this program is preparing students for the future. We are teaching um, hybrid and electric technology to our students. Uh, they will have an opportunity to um, learn how those systems work, how to safely operate and work on those systems, and troubleshoot them at some point. About 180 high school students are part of this year's program and there is a wait list for the academy. Um, I would describe it as like exciting, um, it's fun. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. All right, good downpours in some areas. We can actually say that. These aren't little, you know, showers, <laughs> pesky showers. Downpours <laughs> yeah. in some parts of our area, Adam. Yes, the meaningful rain and even some redevelopment right now in Val Verde County. Now, I will say the Doppler radar that's closer to Del Rio, it's out in Brackettville, is actually down for maintenance right now. So that's why we haven't really focused on this area as much because we don't have a very good picture of it. So this is the view from the... Uh, from a different radar site farther to the north, and then you switch over to the one closer to San Antonio, which is situated in New Braunfels, and you see some of that activity, uh, but we're looking pretty high in the sky here, west of I-35, southwest of town. Regardless, this is some good soaking rain and this stratiform rain behind the downpours that may contain a little bit of lightning and thunder, but not a whole lot. That's the good soaking rain. Edwards County, Real County, now moving into Uvalde County, parts of Northern Kinney County. 
But right now the development is right along the cold front and even outflow boundary here that's east of San Antonio. So we're talking Lavaca County starting to see the action build in. I think it's just going to continue to build in Gonzales County scattered in nature. Guadalupe County, you get into Seguin. You've had some passing downpours, but it's all uh, basically just hit or miss coming and going in nature. And that's the going to be the trend, I think, for quite a while. But city of Seguin, you zoom in currently just light rain for the most part, with the exception on the just west of uh, uh, on the west side of town, basically where Kingsbury and Highway 90 come together, one downpour. And there's more activity upstream, closer to Marion and Zool, New Berlin. This is all eastern Bear County where we've got the heavy rainfall up and down I-35, just outside of 1604, just I should say I-10 outside of 1604. This is all I-10, and this is that heavy, good soaking rain. We mentioned Lavernia earlier in the newscast. Here it is. Boom, the heavy rainfall and now it's stretching into Sutherland Springs, Floresville, Poth about to get in on the action as well. It's right on the edge of Poth. This activity is really changing very quickly and drastically. You watch the development over the last hour and it started to come together really nicely here just over the past 30 minutes around Floresville, some lightning associated with it too. And remember that lightning kickstarts the nitrogen cycle in the ground. It's good to have that lightning, not just the rain. Stretching into Atascosa County, that's where we have the development now. So we're starting to see the rain actually lay off a little bit here in and around San Antonio. And I do think there will be a bit of a break this evening in some of that activity and then more regeneration later tonight and even for the morning commute tomorrow. OK, let's look at the rainfall totals so far. I'm going to go to the southeast side of town. This is I 37 1604. Uh, we're around Elmendorf and the yellow pockets here. That's where we've had the highest accumulations. This is right on 1604, two inches. Rabel Road, about two inches of rain. You get around Bronig Lake, two inches of rainfall. That's far south and southeast San Antonio. So some good soaking rain for some folks. And I do think we'll see more rainfall accumulations like this in the days ahead. Hondo, just west of Hondo over two inches, parts of Uvalde County, where you see the yellow over two inches. And I want to point out Bernie as well. Bernie Fair Oaks Ranch, uh, this area over an inch already estimated and even measured with some rain gauges. And check this out. You get right into downtown Bernie, 1.4 inches at closer to Cordillera Ranch, about 0.9. Bergheim, half an inch. So this is good to see. And this is also right along the aquifer recharge zone. Keep that in mind. This is good placement for the aquifer. This is just one computer representation. And I have to say overall, uh, the computer guidance is kind of unreliable for the ex exact placement of these storms. But notice as we go through the night, some redevelopment as that boundary is going to stall overhead. Tomorrow morning, 5 a.m., we're likely to have more showers and downpours popping up, but it's not going to be raining everywhere at once. It's that situation where we see about 40 to 60% of South and Central Texas seeing the rain at any one point. So we keep those rain chances elevated through Thursday, off and on some sunshine in between with those pockets of downpours, the atmosphere saturated. So in this situation, it's just like wringing out a wet towel and it just comes down hard. And it's what we need really, especially the aquifer. 70s currently, 75 at the airport, 95 though in Seguin, that's going to be changing rather rapidly. Uh, Gonzalez at 77 and still 102 Laredo out ahead of the boundary and no rain cooled air there. So tomorrow we start at 75, make it up to about 89, the high temperature with those intermittent little downpours coming and going periodically throughout the day. Same story Wednesday and Thursday. There is the potential for some flash flooding. Keep that in mind and be careful on your commutes, both morning and evening, ponding of water on the roadways and the potential for the flash flooding. But hey, we need this pattern. This is good to see. Exactly. We know the little problems that can come with this kind of weather, mm -hmm. but gosh, we've suffered some other much bigger ones without mm -hmm. it. It's been nice. Mm -hmm. All right, in case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's in case you missed it. It is August 22nd. Although it was initially said the charges of the three suspects could be upgraded, today during a virtual press conference, Sheriff Javier Salazar says charges will remain the same for all three of Martinez's children. 37-year-old Oscar Dominguez, 24-year-old Roxana Carrero, and 18-year-old Pedro Carrero each remain booked under an $85,000 bond and face one count of injury to a, dis a disabled individual causing serious bodily injury. Martinez was hospitalized 
this Thursday when doctors explained she was so weakened she probably would not live. She did die Saturday afternoon due, her to, due to her medical condition. All three adults were living with their mother. Catastrophic rain in the south. Texas slammed overnight, seven inches falling in just three hours. In Dallas, a summer's worth of rain in one night. Water rescues underway in the area that's been plagued by a drought. Rain falling so fast, some drivers forced to abandon their cars. Dr. Anthony Fauci has announced he is leaving his role as the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and chief medical officer to President Joe Biden in December. Fauci says he is not retiring and will continue to work to help advance science and public health. If a lack of internet access is keeping you from climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, you are in luck. The highest peak in Africa now has Wi-Fi. Tanzania's information ministry has installed high-speed internet to serve all the climbers on the mountain. Right now, the coverage is good up to 12,000 feet, which provides coverage for about two-thirds of the mountain. Take another look outside. We got wet roads all around town. 35 at 410 there. You can see as those trucks go through this area, certainly highlighting that ponding on the roads that Adam Kasky was warning us all about. So it's something that's slowing down traffic in a lot of different spots. Take your time getting home. And I do have a, a nice video for you. This oh, is young Cali. Yep. Yes, this is so great. Enjoying the most rain she's ever seen in her life. I know. There Courtney we go. Freeman's little girl. Uh, she's having a blast out there. So sweet. By the way, I'll be live on our KSAT Weather 30 app coming up in about 10, 15 minutes with more updates and whatnot. So we'll keep you updated. Mm -hmm. Enjoy this rain. Thanks for watching.